All right. Uh, we got some people coming in, but we're going to get started. Um, if you don't know, my name is Sahadi Ture. Um, I am the founder of Omni Train. Uh, most of you came through my class. If not my class, they came through Be Ready. Um, just a few rules, I guess, for this session. Um, if you have any questions, you can always just put them in the chat. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to be able to, you know, speak on um, certain topics um, that you might, you know, have some questions about. Um, but for the time's sake and everything like that, we're going to um, go through, make sure you got something to write with. I am recording this, so um, there will be a copy of this lesson um, online. So you don't have to remember everything. Uh, but the goal is to get y'all in a, the right state of mind to talk about pretty much um, developing a personal and home protection plan. All right. Um, if you get, if I'm just trying to make sure everybody can hear me, can you put like, um, just put okay in the chat if you can hear me. Everybody can hear me. Just put okay in the chat um, so I can know that everything is working correctly. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, I see people. All right. I appreciate y'all participation. <laughs> it means a lot. All right, we're going to get started. I know it's Wednesday. I know it's the afternoon. I know some of y'all are getting off work. Some of y'all might be at work, you know. So we're going to go ahead and push through. Um, so we're going to talk about just pretty much developing a personal home protection plan. Um, a lot of times we have different ways of what that look like. I mean, I wanted to be able to just give people the opportunity to understand exactly what it what it means, right? So if you look right here on the screen, you'll see the different um, topics that we're going to go over. We're going to talk about why having a home protection plan is important, um, conflict avoidance and why it's important, situational awareness, the color codes of awareness, observing your environment, concealed carry permits, um, home security, home defense, and also mental exercise that you could do in your home um, each and every day, you know, with your loved ones, um, with your kids, with your significant other, um, by yourself. Like you could do these same um, type of uh, mental exercises. All right. Now, why have a personal home protection plan? All right. Now, before I even get started, I always like to just play this video right here. This video, <laughs> it's it talks about like just making smart decisions. All right. Now, you are all adults. You can do what you want to do, you know, but again, we got to talk about making smart decisions and even looking at this video, like, would you go down this, would you go down this particular hallway or I mean, uh, alleyway? Like what's the purpose of it? You know, even if your car is on the other side, like you got to find a way to go to your car, or get to your destination without going through, um, without going through any type of, you know, alleyways that can cause any type of harm, you know? Um, a lot of times people don't understand that when you get your home protection plan, like it's not only about you on a physical level, you know, legally, financially, and morally, you know, to keep you safe. That's the idea because at the end of the day, your ultimate goal is to avoid any type of conflict in the first place, you know? And the first thing that you could do is just being aware. You know, um, conflict avoidance and situational awareness go hand to hand. So you'll hear me talk about that um, a lot this session. But the goal is to make sure that you have a plan despite what's going on. We always have to have a backup plan. You know, um, you know what? Let me let me let me put some interactions. So the question is, why is conflict avoidance so important? All right. Now, if you want to, I would appreciate it. If you can write in the chat, you know, why is conflict avoidance important? Like, why is it important to you? You know, we're going to take like a minute, you know, just ask like, why is it important to you? You know, um, and then I'll share my my feelings or why I feel. Um, because a lot of times when you become a concealed carry holder or when you, let's, let's just scratch that out. When you become an adult, you have to think about all the things to avoid like any type of conflict, right? <laughs> Cause you got kids, you know, um, you got kids that depend on, you know, you got a job, you got things like that. Um, we got one that said you avoid problems or legal, you avoid problems or legal problems. That's a good one. Um, it's important because it will put you in life changing situations. Yes. A lot of times people don't understand when you have to use your firearm, like it, that costs a lot of money. 
that costs a lot of money. And hopefully y'all signed up for the insurance, the self-defense insurance. If you, if you didn't, we'll cover that too. Um, and again, like someone says, minimum risk, yes. So I don't have to end up doing something I may regret or can't take back. That's a, that's That's major. I think a lot of people don't understand that when you put yourself in situations, I guarantee you it was an option or it was a split moment where you could have been like, man, I could have handled that completely different. You know, I could have handled that completely different. So, again, just going through some of the bullets and points, man. Um, <laughs> it say the only guaranteed method of surviving a violent encounter is to avoid it in the first place. Right? You can't get in a fight if you avoid the fight. If you avoid the argument, that's one of the things that's, like, pretty much self-explanatory. Because at the end of the day, when you have a firearm, you are trained more than an average citizen. You know, so like you should know better. That's what the prosecutor going to say. Like in any situation, like you as an individual should have knew better because you already took a class on conflict avoidance and situational awareness. You know, so these are things that you want to keep in mind. Like these are things that, you know, even if someone come to you on level 10, you know, you got to stay on level one because at the end of the day, you are more trained than them when it comes to conflict avoidance, situational awareness, and using a firearm. Um, and look, that's just what I said, right? <laughs> the prosecuting attorney, um, they're going to want to know, you know, who was the assailant, who was the victim. Um, a lot of times people don't understand that you have to be the innocent party. So you can't be going back and forth with someone when it comes to arguing or things like that. Like, you just can't do it. Because at the end of the day, if you instigate a fight or you don't try to remove yourself from it, you also going to become... Um, you're going to get put in a situation where, you know, you you don't want to be in. Because, again, with any situation that retains self-defense, you will have to court, go to court. Like, that's just standard procedure. And you just want to make sure that you take all precautions before you have to use any type of violence or any type of physical, you know, um, I guess physical uh, fighting or using a firearm, like one of them things. Like, you don't want to be in that position at this moment. Because again, you are responsible not only for you, but responsible for those that surround you. You know, so definitely keep that in mind. All right. So I always talk about the reasonable person test because people don't know about that. The reasonable person test is pretty much a test that the prosecutor comes. Um, they get a random person in the street, bring them to court, and just ask them, like, hey, would this person, would you would have did the same thing this person would do? So say, for instance, you at Walmart and um, someone parking your pocket space, right? Jump in front of you, take the pocket space. You jump out the car, start arguing with them about the pocket space, and then you end up shooting them, right? They would literally go and find somebody on the street, probably someone that probably don't even like guns, and they would just give them the scenario. And they would ask them, you know, is this something that you would do, right? So. Um, the one of the the instructors for the USCCA, I uh, pretty much just break it down in in the same same way. So I'm gonna play this video and just let y'all just hear, you know, from a legal standpoint. When it comes to the law of self-defense, you'll often hear people speak of the reasonable man or reasonable person standard. You might be wondering just who this reasonable person is and what this really means. The idea of a fictitious reasonable person has its beginnings in old English law, which is the source for many of our modern American concepts. It was first used in a civil lawsuit in 1837, where a person stacked bales of hay on a property that had rented in such a way that it was prone to spontaneously igniting. Despite being repeatedly warned about the danger, the defendant did nothing, and as expected, the hay caught fire and ended up destroying two of the landlord's cottages. The landlord sued his tenant, and the court applied the reasonable man standard and found that while the defendant may not have appreciated the risk, a truly reasonable person would have. So he was found responsible in order to pay damages. The reasonable person standard is meant to be an objective one by requiring the level of caution that an ordinarily prudent person would exercise in substantially similar circumstances. The idea of a reasonable person has also been applied in criminal law 
where someone has used force to defend himself or herself. Nearly every state's laws require that when force be used, it be used only when reasonable. And so the question that prosecutors, judges, and juries must decide is whether a reasonable person would have used force in the same circumstances. Now, since this reasonable person doesn't actually exist, the question that the prosecutor instead will have to ask himself or herself is what would a jury think if I presented the facts? If the prosecutor believes that the jury would agree that use of force was reasonable, then the prosecutor would most likely choose not to file charges. On the other hand, if the prosecutor believes that a jury would find the use of force unreasonable, then they most likely will file charges. Now, keep in mind that the average jury member is picked from the community and not from your local shooting club. All right, so we again, we still on conflict avoidance. I mean, at the end of the day, the number one question that you got to ask yourself is, is it worth dying over or going to jail? Right now, when somebody like dealing without like trying to hurt our kids or harm our significant other or family or someone we care about, then yes, is it worth dying over or going to jail? Yes, because I'm trying to protect my loved ones. But you got to also ask yourself, is it worth dying over or going to jail if it's something materialistic? Right? If the answer is yes, because you got to answer that yourself, I can't answer that for you, then you need to prepare to live with the results. Right? That's the jail. Um, that could be death, like whatever it may be. Cause I mean, no one wants to take a life, you know, but that's why it's always asking yourself, is it worth dying over or going to jail? Um, if the answer is no, then you need to work hard to remove yourself from the situation. Uh, we're going to go over three steps that you need to do. I'm um, in every situation. Um, I use them to this day because that's the only way that I'm able to pretty much control each situation. If I ever get in a situation. Um, I know the three steps that goes on mentally to help me in every, in any every situation. All right. And again, just any type of action should be far as last result. All right. Cause I don't want you sitting there here saying like, Oh, because they started, I have to finish it. Like <laughs> them type of things or, um, them type of things that pretty much put people in, in, in the bad predicaments because of the fact that they, they start to think with emotions or they start to think with feelings or ego or pride and things like that. That's going to put you in a bad situation in the long run. So at the end of the day, your last resort is going to be force. All right. So seconds count. I want y'all to look at this picture right here. Um, <laughs> it's three things that you need to do in every situation. The first thing you want to do is avoid. How did you avoid the situation? You just leave. All right. The second thing you're going to do is escape. All right. If you can't avoid the situation, you can escape the situation, which means that, say, for instance, you're in a room and everybody just start fighting. You want to just take the nearest exit. That's how you escape the situation. Now, if you can't avoid it and it's, the exits are blocked, then you have to defend. All right. The moment you defend yourself, after you defend yourself, you need to go from defend back to escape. So the moment that you can escape a situation, you need to take it because at the end of the day, they're going to ask that question. Was you able to escape? No, not at first. But as the seconds went on, it went from being able to not escape to escape. So any type of situation you get into, you need to pretty much mentally use this checklist every single time. All right. Any questions about the three outcomes far as when it comes to violent attacks if not you can put them on i mean you can put them in a the chat or you can come off a of mute um if you have any questions so far when it comes to um you know anything that's leading up to this these seconds counts when it comes to avoid escape or defend all right um if you identify the individual as a possible threat when they're more than 100 feet away you can get away from that all right but it's if it's someone that's 21 feet or in your bubble then you might can't avoid, you might can't escape. You might have to defend and then go back to escape when you get an opportunity, all right? And everybody already knows seconds count. Every second count. Now, I like this um, graph that you see because it kind of breaks it down, right? So we go to avoid. Like, that's the first thing that we need to do, avoid a situation. The warning time for... Avoiding something is a minute or more. 
You'll never know. You'll never know whether or not you just avoided a violent crime because you're already gone, right? We could live with that. You were right about the situation. You just got to get out of jail free card because at the end of the day, you got, you kind of was on your P's and Q's when it came to it and you got in the car and you rolled out. And the last thing I always like is when it comes to the avoid is your blood remains in your body where it belongs. Your money remains in your bank where it belongs. And lastly, uh, you get to go home with your family. Like that's the biggest thing. Um, you are able to go back to your family. Um, you went to the store in one piece. You get to come home in one piece. Now, if you can't avoid that, we got to think about escape. They say it takes between five and 30 plus seconds to escape. You identify a dangerous situation in time to, to leave, to exit. Before your options are limited to defend, but you're still in the middle of a bad situation, right? Like I said, if everybody stopped fighting in a room, you have between five and 30 seconds, you know, that's the window for you can escape the situation, right? And then you got someone that, if you think about it, them five to 30 seconds, it could be sooner than that, you know? Um, ah, Kenny, you made a good point. Um, Kenny in in a, in a chat he was saying when the boy killed that man over hitting his mother in the curry out right he could have definitely could have used the three step rule definitely now like I said every situation is case case by case sometimes you won't be able to go through should I avoid this should I escape this do I gotta go sometimes you might have to go straight to the fin you just never know but the goal is you want to be able to catch the signs before you have to defend. And if you see defend, defend is three to five seconds. Three to five seconds. Why do you think that defend is three to five seconds? All right, why you putting them in the chat? I'm still going to say it. But why do you think defend is only three to five seconds? Yep, it happened fast, split second decisions. Like when you got to defend yourself, it, it happened so fast that you're not even aware of the aftermath until your adrenaline and everything start, you know, coming down. Um, again, you can always <laughs> use your firearm, but again, every time you use your firearm, they're going to take it because it's going to be evidence. Um, you're going to have to, again, get self-defense insurance. Um, some type of representation. So hopefully, like I said, if you have the insurance, that's cool. If not, and you need more information on that, I'll drop a link, you know, by the end of the class. Um, but also, if you knew that the use of the firearm and self-defense would result in you going to jail and causing you tens of thousands of dollars, you know, would that affect your decision to use your gun? All of that, I say all of that because at the end of the day, I feel confident in being able to defend myself, not only for my training, but also from the fact that I have uh, $2 million in insurance um, policy for self-defense, you know? So I won't be hesitant to use my firearm because I'm thinking about going to jail, you know, or, you know, not having enough money to represent, to get a representation for court. That's the last thing that's on my mind when I'm trying to protect myself. Now, Let's talk about situational awareness, all right? So situational awareness is an awareness of our immediate vicinity and of the people and objects within the environment. Now, I want everybody to look at the lady on the left side, right? That got the phone in her hand. Do you see how small her situational bubble is? That's how small her bubble is. So every time you go on the phone, remember like, hey, uh, your bubble is kind of small. You cannot see your environment. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I multitask. I don't care how you multitask. When you see that small bubble, that happens every single time you are sending a text message, you are playing a game with your phone, and think about how many times you'll be on your phone in public, right? You're not even thinking about that because it's like, oh, yeah, I can see. Can you really see, right? And I always want you to test yourself. I want you, um, if you have a kid in the house or if you have, um, your partner in the house, I want you to get on your phone and, and you don't got to do it right now, but you get on your phone, right? And you about to send a text message and tell them to put up 
put up a number, put up a number of fingers, and you're going you're going to try to tell them what how many fingers they have that they have holding up without you lifting your eyes off your phone, right? It's kind of tough to do that. Now I want you to try, and I want you to let me know if you was able to do it. Even though I know some people are going to tell me that they did it. Uh, the goal is again. Even without distractions of electronic device, many people focus, it's not farther than the circle that's in front of you, you know? So just keep that in mind. Like the goal is um, if you're waiting for someone, like, you know, waiting for somebody to come out the house or you wait for somebody to come out the, the, the store, you want to be able to be vigilant at all times because everything happened in seconds. The moment that you got to drop your phone to pick up your firearm and then do this and do that, like it's too late. So remember that, you know, you want to have as much visibility at at, at all times, when, especially when you're out in public. All right. And again, situation awareness, just being that you're aware of everything that's around you. We don't got no eyes in the back of our head, so we can't really see behind us. That's our blind spot. That's our blind spot. You know, we got to think of ourselves for having this bubble. And in order to minimize our blind spot, we just have to rotate. When I say rotate, we need to, as we walk and as we move in, we need to move our, our, our heads from left to right, you know, at all times. And it might seem weird at first, but you got to be moving. As you move in throughout, like in a grocery store or whatever it may be, you just need to make sure that you just keeping your head on the swivel, as they say. Because that's the only way where you're going to minimize this blind spot that you see that's behind you. Because, again, you don't have eyes in the back of your head. So the only way that you minimize that blind spot is being able to, you know, go side to side. And like I said, it's going, it's going to feel real weird, but at the same time, it's going to put you in a better situation. It's going to put you in a better situation, at least to when it comes to, you know, you being able to protect yourself and your family. All right. Now, they said, if you look on that, on the left side, 21 feet. 21 feet, right? They <laughs> The Salt Lake City Police Department, um, they measured that at 21 feet, someone can get to you in about 1.5 seconds. 1.5 seconds, right? That's pretty fast. It don't matter. It don't matter what size they are. They could cover the same distance, 1.5 seconds, all right. So the thing is, you want to make sure that you'll be able to draw your firearm or defend yourself to someone. So you need to be aware of them between 32 and 50 feet. Right. Or more. Because at the end of the day, that's the danger zone. If you look at the image on the right hand side with the yellow circle, that's the danger zone right there. That yellow, not the red. The red is kind of meaning it's like it's too late. All right. So we want to if it's anything that's going to happen. We want to make sure that we catch them that yellow before they get to the red. All right. So again, you got to just stay on your P's and Q's when it comes to anything. And again, all you got to do, if you want to test this three, is have someone in the house or have a friend stand like 21 feet away and attack you or try to charge at you while your firearm, while you trying to draw your firearm. You're going to see how fast they get to you, all right? So, again, these are good practices. These are good mental practices that you could take on, all right? And that's the best drill that I like to see. Now, not looking like a victim. I know some of y'all like to be outside with y'all hip, y'all ear pods on, and y'all jamming, and y'all moving, and y'all might be running, y'all might be walking, running errands, and things like that. Um, but the ultimate goal is not to have you out here looking like a victim. Now, how to not look like a victim is if you see someone moving funny, acting funny, make eye contact with them, right? You see how this lady looking at you on the screen? That's the same way that you need to look at look at them, all right? When you make eye contact, all it's saying is, hey, look, I see you, right? You ain't got to lift your, 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 your shirt up to tell them you got a gun. You don't got to do none of that. All you got to do is make eye contact with them and let them know, hey, listen, I see, I don't know what you're doing, but I see that you try and do something. It might not be to me, but it's it's in this area and you're making me uncomfortable. You don't have to say that, but again, just give them the eye contact, you know, in that same breath. Like for those who have kids, right? 
just the look that you get at them before they about to do something, right? That's the same way I want you to look at it. Like your kid about to do something crazy, you just give them that stir, and they be like, ah, right, you know what? I'm gonna go somewhere else. That's that's the same type of stir that you want to have. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Thank thank you for saying that. Yes. Now, if you don't have a training pistol, if you don't have a training pistol, you can use your finger. All right. You can use your finger. Right. I don't want anyone to go out here and draw your firearm and you got one in the chamber or your gun is loaded. All right. If you signed up with the insurance, do you have a yellow gun? It's a yellow gun that comes with um with your with your um can. Um and again, if you don't have that, you can go on Amazon, you can go to any gun store, they do have replica firearms that you can use. But again, please don't use your use your your live firearm, you know, even if it's not loaded. I don't know. I, I can't even point any type of firearm, even if it's a um a real gun, fake gun, whatever it may be. I still can't point it to anyone. So like, it's kind of hard for me. So again, because it's just habit, it's just a habit. Uh, but the goal is just make sure that you want to make that you, that you have that, um, that training, because at the end of the day, that's the only way you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and to avoid any potential threats, you need to step off the line. Do anybody know what stepping off the line means? I'm going to step off the line, right? If I'm going down the street, how do I step off the line? How do I step off the line? Yes, cross the street. <laughs> cross the street. A lot of people, it's, it's simple, right? Did you ever see, now listen, I grew up in the hood, right? And if somebody came walking down the street and there was a group of us on the street, like just standing there, they will cross the street because they don't even know what's going on, but they don't even want to even attempt to have any type of situation, all right? So you can always cross the street, always, right? You can speed up your walking or slow down your walking depending on what the situation might be, you know? So at the end of the day, stepping off the line is perfectly fine. And again, walk with a purpose. If you walk, got your headphones in and you walking slow, you are looking like a victim. Oh, I'm about to take their stuff. I'm about to rob them. I'm about to do whatever I want to do with them because at the end of the day, you're not walking with a purpose. Like every time you walk in, you get out your car, you need to walk with a purpose. You walk into your car, you need to walk with a purpose because you got people, they looking at, they looking at individuals that look like victims. And that's how they choose who they want to rob and who they want to take from. If I see you, if I'm someone that's looking for a victim and I see you power walking to your car, I'm like, yeah, I'm not messing with that lady or I'm not messing with that man because they got somewhere to be, you know? So, but if you, if you moving, like you ain't got no pace, like it's always going to be a problem. Like you always got to keep it moving. And like I said, sometimes even if you out with family, like I press everybody, look, let's get in the car. Let's start moving. Like, call me when you get in the car, when you driving, you know, and we could talk like that. We just sitting around here. It don't, it don't feel right to me. You know, it don't feel right to me. And like I said, walk with a purpose. All right. So I want y'all to imagine two individuals walking down the street. We got the first person walking with purpose, moving at a quick enough pace that she looked like she going somewhere. She's swiveling her head to scan the area. And she making quick eye contact with anyone in her immediate area. And then we got the second person shuffling along at a slow pace and focus on the three in circle in front of them while he sends a text message on the cell phone. Which person do you think a criminal want to target? First person or second person? Yep, yep, yep. There y'all go. And it's real simple. And like, I know um, my daughter is 12 now, but when she was young and, and parents that have like smaller kids, like I'm going to tell y'all now, this might seem kind of weird, but how I used to do it is, I had, like I said, I had one child had my daughter. So what I would do is I will put her in the car. Like I wouldn't even strap her to the car. So I would put her in the car 
Then I would get in my car, then I would lock the door, and then I would put her in the in the car seat. Now, again, I don't know how your dynamics are set up, but I always tell people all the time, like, get your kid in the car, then you get in the car and you lock the doors, and then you were able to like get in the gap. Because remember, if anybody got kids and they know when they put them kids in them car seats, it take a little minute to put them kids in the car seat. And think about how many seconds go by when you got to strap them up and you got to do this and you got to do that. Like, you got to avoid all of that. Like, just put them in a car. You're not driving yet. Put them in a car. Go around. Lock it. Boom. You get in. Lock it. And then handle your business. All right? I just want y'all to get that to take that opportunity because at the end of the day, again, like, seconds count. All right, now, I want y'all to look at this man. Do he look like a victim? Do he look like a victim? He probably like 6'4", like two something. Is he a victim? <laughs> yes. Yes, he is. Why is he a victim? Right? Tell me why. Why is he a victim? Give me some signs that he's a victim. Because he looked pretty, he looked pretty tough to me. Not paying attention, not aware, caught locking, looking at his phone, sitting down, head on the phone, distracted. There we go. Listen, too relaxed. That that's a good point. Too relaxed. Um, and when we go over the color codes of awareness, y'all gonna see exactly what I mean when I say too relaxed. Like you should never be too relaxed, especially with you getting a firearm, like or you having a firearm. Some people in this um in this class are taking the class. They they about to come to. They are about to come to our concealed carry class in the next couple of weeks. Um, some of y'all, most of y'all already took the class. So this is a nice, um, this is a nice additional course. And we'll do different courses like this um, throughout the months just to keep you aware. Because again, the course itself has a lot of information, but I like to go in detail when it comes to developing a home protection plan like this. All right. So again, regardless how tough you might look on the outside, all a criminal will look for is whether or not you look like an easy victim. Because somebody could come behind him right now, hit him in his head, you know, get him at gunpoint. Like, it's a lot of things that can happen right now. And for, he's sitting on the curve. I don't know where he at, but he's sitting on the curve. Um, and his doc. So, making a game out of situational awareness. How can you make it a game out of situational awareness? Right? That's the question. But I thought this was about serious stuff. It is about serious stuff. But we still got to make a game out of situ situational awareness because the police do it. All right? Try to identify anybody who might carry a firearm. Do you think the police have a gun? Do they? Do they? Do you think the police have a gun reader that can scan the area to figure out who got guns on them? No. What do they do? How do the police know that this person got a gun on them? What do you think that they what do you think they do? What are some signs that someone got a gun on them? Yes, printing, your print. The print. Oh man, why are you picking on me? I mean, I ain't picking on you. I see a, a a gun handle that look like a gun handle sticking out your clothes. Or you got a hoodie on. Now, this is always controversial. You got a hoodie on in 90 degree weather. Now, mind you. I was just out on Sunday and some young kids had on hoodies. It was baking outside and like they still had on hoodies, you know, but um, no, that's true. That's true. How they dress, how they moving. Um, you got to adjust. If they keep adjusting themselves, like the police would sit right there and look at that. Oh no. So it was a, it was a false narrative. When I was young, they used to tell me in DC that, the jump outs, which is just unmarked police cars that used to jump out on people. They used to have a gun scanner. Like they don't have no gun scanner. I used to think that too. I really used to believe that, but they don't have a gun scanner because if that's the case, they would, they would have, it's, it's, it's so many, it's so many uh, violations I, I would think would happen um, if they was able to scan guns, like the fine guns, um, but they don't have a gun scanner. I thought they did too. Um, watch the hands and eyes or pay attention to people approaching you in danger zones. Look for individuals in condition white. We're going to go and check out the conditions in a minute. Um, and take your time. Take the time to monitor yourself. 
Because you got to look at yourself and say, dang, do I look like a victim? Ask yourself that, do I look like a victim? Because at the end of the day, if you do, you need to reevaluate yourself before you even step out that door. All right. Now, we got the color codes of awareness. The color codes of awareness was they was made for the U.S. Marines when they came out. Like when the Marines came out, like when they was back to like um, on the civilian side, um, Colonel Jeff Cooper was just trying to get them to be able to um, separate being on the battlefield and being a civilian. Um, so he came up with these color codes of awareness. So condition white, you are unaware of what's going on around you. You don't think nothing going to happen to you. You got your <laughs> ear pods on. You listen to your favorite song. You can't hear what's going on around you. Uh, most criminals look for you in this uh, condition white, all right? Condition white is just unaware. You cannot be a condition white if you are trying to stay alive. I'm just going to keep it completely honest, all right? And you might be, you might be in condition white. A lot of people be in condition white when they go home. Like, it's my house. I should be at peace. I'm chilling. I'm relaxing. But at the same time, you you causing a whole nother situation because you're not aware of what's going on, right? Never allow yourself to be in condition white when you arm. Because if you're in condition white and you unaware of what's going on, somebody can beat you up. Somebody can take your gun. Somebody can shoot you with your own gun, which I think is one of my biggest fears. Um... But you never want to be in condition white. All right. So condition white, we never want to be in that. Now we got condition yellow. You are aware of your surroundings. All right. At this point, this is the condition that you want to be in while you're in public. Now I used to be in condition white. I'm, I'm in condition yellow, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm not in condition yellow anymore. All right. But this is the condition that you need to be in at the minimum. All right. At this point, you are aware of what's happening in your immediate in your immediate vicinity, and you proceed with caution. You're not overreacting, you're not paranoid, but at this point, you still are in a position where it's like, okay, um, just in case something was to happen, I'll be aware. All right. And I just said it because I I, I, I these slides I know by heart, so I kind of jump ahead a little bit. But again, you're not paranoid or overreacting, but you keep an eye out for potential threats and you walk like you got somewhere to be, all right? Your posture, your eyes, and your demeanor say, I am alert, and you walk faster than a crowd. If you arm, you must be at least in condition yellow. All right, everybody got cadet? All right, boom, condition yellow. So we got condition white, unaware. Condition yellow, you got aware. And now condition orange is heightened awareness. All right, in condition orange, you have identified a potential, a possible threat or threats. This is a heightened state of awareness. Now, condition orange is what I be in from like now and on. Like every time I walk out the door, I'm in, I'm in condition orange. You realize something may be wrong. I'm not going to lie to you. I feel like something's always going on outside. So I just feel like I need to always be in condition orange. All right. Now you personally might be like, oh, condition yellow is like where I'm going to be at, which is cool. But I am I'm I live in condition orange because I've realized that something may be wrong. Um, it might be danger to myself or others. Um, and people acting funny or people driving weird or people just any type of funny behavior. Um, that's 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 when I say to myself, OK, I need to be a little bit more aware. My heightened awareness is already there. Um, you make a plan on how to react. So then I I know y'all seen movies where people might be sitting in a chair somewhere and they kind of like plan out the whole situation. If somebody was to come through this door shooting, I would have to do this and do this and do that. All right. Now in condition orange, I think about that in every situation, right? And you don't have to be like me, but even if I'm sitting at the light and it's red and it's been red for too long. I'm going to check in my three points on my mirrors, like my left mirror, the mirror inside, and then um, my right mirror. I'm just looking, making sure nobody's walking up to my car, making sure uh, my door is locked. These are things that I'm just making sure that I know, like, because at the end of the day, if somebody tried to pull on my door or something like that, I could drive off and this, that, and third. So I'm making plans on how to react when it comes to any situation. 
you may begin to take, you know, action such as issuing verbal commands. Um, anybody know any type of verbal commands that you need to say when a situation is occurring? Any type of commands that you need to say? Yep, stop. What else? Don't come closer. What else? Any other commands that we need to say? Any commands that we can't say? Yeah, please back up. That's a good one. Any commands that we can't say? What are some commands that we can't say? Oh, yeah, I'm going to blow your head off. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to shoot. Yeah, because that's a tricky one. Because if you if we go to court, say if I was about to rob you, and I tell the court, well, Pat said I'm, that they was going to shoot me. And I had to pull out my knife, even though I already pulled out my knife first because I was going to try to rob you, right? You can't say anything. You got to say, hey, stop. Don't come any closer. Pretty simple. All right. And at this point, you got to decide on the mental trigger, right? That will move you to take action. Remember, avoid, escape, or defend, right? Them are things, three things that's going on. And you got to mentally prepare if, you, if it's a confrontation or you got to escape. That's like a real thing. You got to make a split decision on what's working and what's not, or what's going to work or what's not, right? Your pistol. When you're in condition orange, you don't have to draw your firearm. But if you do, or if you have to, please be prepared to use it. Make sure it's clear. Make sure that you're going through all the mental checklists before you draw your firearm. And lastly, we have condition red. At this point, condition red means it's going down. It's action. It's some type of action. Action is immediate, right? So you already went through the mental triggers and they've been tripped and now you need to execute your plan. Either you are escaping or you're going to defend yourself, right? And you have to trust your instincts. You can run away from the situation, right? Say you run away from the situation that not, that's not even a situation. It's okay. It's okay. Because what if you don't run away and then you get yourself caught in a situation that you like, dang, man, if I would have just re removed myself, it would have made it a lot better. Right? That's one of the things that you want to think about. Um, and your instincts in the drilling will cause reactions. Right? So you got to understand, did you ever run? Anybody got chased by a dog when they was young and you couldn't feel your feet? But you know you was running fast as hell, but you couldn't feel your feet. That's a part of the, that adrenaline that, that, that goes on, you know, when you like, I don't know how I'm running this fast. Or, prime example, a dog come running at you. What's the first thing you do? If you buy a car, you jump on the car. Your leg can be broke, but you're going to jump on that car. It gave you, God gave you the strength to jump on that car, and you don't know how you got up there, but you know you ain't getting down until that, to that dog is gone. Right. So again, in the condition red, you got to be ready for all of the instincts and the adrenaline that's going to rush through your body when the situation happens. All right. And again, when this situation, like when stuff go down, your hands and your feet, well, your fingertips and your feet is going to be real cold. It's going to go numb. You're not going to feel them because when your body go into flight or fight, fight or flight, all of the blood rush to the major, major organs. So it, it's in protective mode. So your hands and your feet go numb. So when y'all signed up for this, for this, for this training, this personal one-on-one -on -one training, uh, once you get through the basics, I pretty much put your hands in some cold water, like some ice that I bring to the range and the blow like um cool cooler. Put your hands in there for about three, four minutes, your hand get real cold. And you're not going to feel the trigger from your trigger finger, but you're going to still be able to shoot. Is this teaching you how to manage your body once you get into them real situations? All right. But that's for later on. That's not for right now. Um, and again, make sure you retreat if you have to. If not, then uh, you have to use the force and make sure you use the force and then escape. All right. And again, escape. Say your commands, engage in the threat. If you can't escape, hey, stop, don't come any closer. All right, that's that's all you need to say. If they still coming at you, then you have to take care of your business. All right, no one want to take no one life. All right, we understand that. 
At the end of the day, if it's a choice, if I have to make a choice between me going home or they going home, what you think? You know, what you think? Now, let's talk about uh, who? areas to avoid. Now, <laughs> how crazy this may sound, a lot of y'all cut corners. Like when I mean going around a corner, you cutting corners so close that if someone was in your blind spot on the other side of that corner, they'd, they'd knock you out. They can grab you. They can rob you. From this point on, I need you taking wide turns. It may sound weird, but I need you taking wide turns because you never know who's on the other side of the, the corner, who's around the corner. All right, wide turns. It sounds weird, but I promise you, if you do these things, it's going to make a lot of sense. All right, take wide turns. Wide turns. And get ready to run if, if somebody to do, you know. Let's talk about other areas to avoid. Low light areas, all right? Where would you see this type of area at? What places would you see this type of area? Let me know. What places would you see this low light area at? What's some places? I know a few offhand, um, but what's some places that you would see this particular, yep, office buildings, apartment buildings, hotels, underground, yep, parking garages. What about malls? Uh, sometimes I, movie theaters, yep. Man, listen, y'all. Movie theaters. So you got to think about all these different places. You need to plan a route that's well lit. I don't care how close it is to your destination. You need to go somewhere where, you, where it's well lit because if you go somewhere that don't got no light in, like, you know, no one can't really see if it's something going on or not. Even with this situation right here, right? Other areas to avoid. Yes, hospitals. Hospitals is a good one. Um, especially because they have the structure. Again, like, y'all see these places. Y'all, a lot of these places that we name it areas to avoid, you either deal with them on a the day-to-day or you are about to deal with them, you know, depending on what's going on where you at. Um, you see this shortcut to your to your to your car, right? It might be a long night. Ladies, you might be coming from being out with your girlfriends or whatever. And you like, yo, it's 20 steps through this alley to get to my car. Right? That's good because it's like, oh, man, I can get to my car quick. But it's also bad because that's a window of opportunity for the criminals. All right? I know your feet hurt, but you got to take the long route because with the long route, when it's on streets, it's more cameras. It's more witnesses, all right? When you have your license to carry, the more witnesses, the better, all right? The more witnesses, the better, all right? So it don't matter how convenient the shortcut is. Take the long way, all right? Take the long way. I promise you it's going to be all right. All right, we got barriers, we got covers, and we got concealment. A barrier is any object you can place between yourself and the attacker, all right? Concealment is anything that hides you from the threat, such as a closed door, a wall, or anything you could duck behind. And then we had cover. Cover protects you from incoming bullets. Cover would include things like concrete pillars or the front of a vehicle. All right. Not okay. When I when we say the front of a vehicle, we talk about the engine block, not you like sitting on front of the in front of the car. All right, but the engine block. So if you was hiding behind one of the sides of the car and the engine was in front of you, you know, that would be a cover. Now, let me ask you, a barrier is any object you could place between yourself and the attacker. What are some barriers that you could think of? I'm going to say one that I never want you to use, though, as a barrier, but a person can be a barrier, right? A person can be a barrier, but please don't, don't put no person in front of you. Don't do that. All right. What other barriers that we can use? Uh, what other concealments we can use? Um, you got to think about also when you think about concealment, it has to hide you from the threat. If you are hiding behind a glass door, that's not concealment. Clearly, the threat can still see you. All right. So make sure that when it comes to concealment, is anything that's hiding you from the threat. 
And then cover is anything that's going to block you or protect you from bullets. All right. That's the biggest thing. All right. And wherever you go, make sure that you can identify an escape route. I'm talking about if you go to your mama house or if you go to your friend's house, you know exactly where to go at if anything was to pop off. All right. That's the thing that you need to know. That's the thing that you need to know. All right. Now, because we actually, uh, we got like 10 more slides to go. And like I said, this is recorded. So you will have access to this. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. I'll drop the link at the end. So if y'all ever want to go back and, and look at it and, you know, pause it and take notes, you can always do that. But again, I'm going to respect your time. So we're going to be pushing through when it comes to this. Um, home security, because this is why you're here. Home security. Uh, students of self-defense can spend hours or days studying and training on methods of standing safe in public, but people forget how sloppy they are when it comes to their own house. All right? Now, a lot of people be in condition white when they're at home, like I already said. Um, when it comes to the FBI, the FBI actually broke down a few statistics when it came to people um, breaking into other people's home, criminals breaking into the home. Um, at the end of the day, they said 34% of the time, people come through the front door. Criminals come through the front door. They come through the back door or the screen door 22% of the time, and they come through the first floor windows 23% of the time. Now, I live on the fourth floor, so if somebody climb up here, then that, they just going out their way. But first floor windows 23% of the time. All right. Let me ask y'all, how many people, when they moved in, changed their locks? How many people changed their locks? How many people changed their locks on their doors? If you didn't change your locks, go change your locks. If you moved in to a new house or you got a house, make sure you change your locks. Hopefully everybody changed their locks. No one should have no copy of anything unless it's like your immediate family in the house. All right? Now, and again, a lot of people don't think about windows. Windows, if you don't, if you got to, I want you to go look at your windows and see how your window lock is. If it's a plastic window lock, you need to get a, a bar stop for that. All right. They got bar stops at um, Home Depot. They got them at Lowe's or Amazon. Because at the end of the day, if you got plastic locks on your windows, if somebody lift it up hard enough, it'll break, all right? Or it'll pop off. Um, also, look at your door hinges. If you got door hinges on the inside or the outside, I mean, they should be inside, but some people might got door hinges on the outside. Like, just make sure that you look at pretty much just the checklist. And like I said, I'll just show y'all what the checklist will look like. You know, just looking at your own home, check the lights. Um, make sure that none of your locks are rusted or old. Do you have a security system? Um, is it connected to an alarm service, motion detective, glass breaking sensor? These are things that you need to ask yourself. All right. Cause some people, they don't even think about it. It's like, Hey, listen, it's in like my house is secure. I got a gun and that's it. Now you having the top security or you having dogs or you having this and that, it's not going to stop someone from coming to your house, but it gives you different levels of security. Like maybe when you got an alarm system and the alarm go off and someone try to break in, they run away, which means that if you did have an alarm system and they break in, you might have to use your firearm. The alarm scared them off enough where you don't have to use your firearm, you know? So these are a couple of things that you want to put in place. Now, this is the craziest part. This is one of the craziest things that I've seen statistic-wise. Um, I know that people, insurance companies let people know that, hey, listen, between 60 to 81% of people do not set their alarms when they go on vacation or when they're at home. And the number one excuse is pets because pets got to go in and, in and out the house. So again, some of y'all alarms has like pet motion sensors now. But that's like the number one reason why people don't set their alarms because they're pets. 
All right. So if you got a pet, <laughs> let's make sure that you um, you have that alarm system where you can still set it, even if they go in and out of the house. And this is my nice home defense checklist. You could take a picture of this. You could screenshot it, whatever you want to do. All right. Because it's asking you certain questions. Do you have front lights or back lights in your house? It's the alarm on. Are your doors locked? Is the home defense firearm in its proper location? Is it loaded? Like, where's the phone? How do you dial 911 in the dock? You know, what room do you go to? What room do you go to if someone wants to break in? Where do your family go? How do you identify a friend from a foe? Um, I read a story how a sister, one a sister shot another sister because she came into the house intoxicated. And she wasn't in the right state of mind to turn the, the alarm off. And one sister ended up shooting the other sister. She didn't die, but that could have been avoided if they had like a family code. So that's why I always tell people, what's a family code word to identify who you are and where you are? You know, does each family member know how to dial 911? That sounds so crazy, right? Do they know how to dial 911? But you have kids in the house. Do they know how to dial 911? Right? Do each person in the house know how to use home defense ammunition or home defense firearms? You know, what you do when the police arrive. These are all the things that you want to think about when it comes to, you know, having that plan. All right? And again, this is just a sample plan. You know, I probably hear an alarm, but then true, the Michael grabs the locking box and Sir grabbed the phone. So Michael, go get the gun. Sir, go get the phone to call the police. Then, Sir, get Sam and retreats the jack room, right? Michael takes a position in the hallway and starts the situation and starts yelling his commands so the intruder to, to leave. These are all of the things. This is a nice home defense plan that you could use. Nice home defense plan. And like I said, this is a sample, but you need to share this with your family. Share this with your family. Let them know, hey, we need to have a plan just in case anything was to happen. That's what we need to do. Lastly, we have mental exercises, all right? These are some of the mental exercises you could do on the range or while you're in the house. Now, if you're at home, I want you to just relax and say like, dang, I'm at home. What if I hear the front door being kicked down? What do I do? What if I hear somebody break into the window? What if my alarm goes off in the middle of the night? What if a stranger at the door suddenly produces a weapon? What if I find a door to my house open upon arriving home? I mean, again, you would just stay outside and call 911 and let the police do their job because you are not trained to go in there and find whoever's in your house. All right, what if I hear someone in the house at night? How do I know that's not my door to just sneak in a snack at two o'clock in the morning on summer break? How do I know that's not her? Or how do I know that's her? What should I do if I hear someone outside of the house? What if I believe he or she is still in my property? Call the police clearly. All right, boom, we move into public. What if, I, what if I'm approached by one or more individuals who cause me concern? What if I step off the line and they follow me? What do I do if they produce a weapon? What if it's a knife? What if it's a gun? What if a threat materializes between the loved one and me? Mm. What if I say an attack in progress on someone else? What do I do? If I see someone who I believe has committed a crime or is about to commit a crime, what should I do? Should I follow the individual? <laughs> or should I stay in a safe location and call 911? These are things that you, these are all just mental exercises and scenarios that you can go through. All right, let's think about this one. Let's see. What are my options? Can I avoid the situation entirely? Can I escape? Am I forced to defend myself? What cover or barriers are available? How do I move off the line? How do I draw from the holster? What commands do I give? What are the requirements for speed versus accuracy? Whenever you take a private lesson with me, we focus on accuracy first, and then we focus on speed. All right? 
These are all the things. How do I clear firearm? How do I perform a reload? What do I do once I had to defend myself? Who do I call? These are all of the things that, again, is going to get you to that point. But again, you have to take this serious. These are things that you have to take serious because these are things that can happen. All right? Now, lastly, a permit to carry fits. Your concealed carry permit is not an invincibility shield. We cannot look at our permits as a permit to go places, do things, or say things that we shouldn't say otherwise. Don't go, once you get your license, don't be out here power tripping, you know, because you got a gun, you know. They didn't stop making guns because you got one. Remember that, all right? Remember that. Your permit is not a shield of any kind. Police do what they do, which means they're going to go chase down the bad guys. All we're doing is defending ourselves if we have to, all right? And lastly, it's not a fix for bad behavior. What that means is exposing your firearm in an attempt to change someone's behavior could result in felony assault charges, the loss of your permit, or anything else the prosecutor can come up with. If you're at home and your partner hogging up the TV or your roommate hogging up the TV, you cannot pull out your gun to take the TV from them or to take the remote from them or anything like that. You cannot change someone's behavior like that because you're going to go to jail for, again, felony assault charges, attempted murder. That's a lot. That's a whole list that can happen. All right. So, again, what is your concealed carry permit good for? It's a permit to carry a firearm. That's all it is. It provides a right to carry an object that might otherwise be illegal to carry, but it affords us no special rights. Instead, it places additional, additional limits on our actions and behavior, and it places more serious penalties on any law we violate. All right? So that, that pretty much covered everything as far as this um, developing a personal home protection plan. Um, again, I will um, have this up so you can go through, especially going back to the checklist, so you'll be able to um, you know, go through your necessary protection plan for yourself. Yes, we are held to a higher standard because of the fact that we do the training. We have the training. We took, we took, we went through the class, we passed all these things that we should know. Um, they're gonna hold us, they're gonna hold it to us. All right. Um now, do we have any questions, questions, comments, concerns? Um, when it comes to home defense, home protection, um, any type of plan, any questions, we're taking questions now. Um, and I'm also going to do, if some of y'all, some of y'all already came through the class, um, but again, if you need renewals or anything like that, please reach out to me because at the end of the day, we're going to have the opportunity to, you know, make sure that you stay up to date because if your license expire, then you won't be able to carry your gun until you get that license renewed. Um, you want to start that process like six, uh, probably like, yeah, like six months. I say six months, like like three to six months ahead of time because again, you know how the process is. A process could take as long as you, um, as, as long as they want it to take. Do we have any questions, any comments, any concerns? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, some of y'all probably already, already on there. Um, I'm going to drop the YouTube. Um, they say, once the alarm goes off and how should we retreat? Then call the police, not go see what's going on. Now, that's a good question. Because me personally, if my alarm goes off, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check. I'm, I know me personally. But if you can hear people or you get, you get a sense that someone is in your house, you just want to take your family, go to a safe room, lock that door, and call 911. Now, most, um, most alarm systems, they have, um, they have people like once the alarm go off, the police will show up. Uh, the police will show up. So that's like one of them things. But again, you got to make sure that that's a part of your uh, alarm system. 
Um, because that's the one thing that I always tell people, like when you get a chance, and you get an alarm system, just go over everything that you might need to go over with them to know, you know, what's going on. Like, is this going to happen? That's going to happen. You know, can I lock my, can I lock my house up through my phone? Like all these different things. These are questions that you need to ask when it comes to um, the, your home alarm system. All right. Um, I do have everyone number. So what I'll do, it, I have a number of emails. So I'll send that out. Um, I'll send um, the YouTube and everything out if you haven't already signed up for the YouTube, which I know most of y'all probably already did. Um, and if you don't have your, I know some of y'all already signed up, but if you don't have a concealed current, if you don't have your license yet, if you don't have like anything, because you took this class, just text the number that um, texts you with the Zoom link and we got a special deal for you. Um, I ain't gonna tell you what it is until you text. But um, other than that, um, I definitely appreciate y'all. We do have, we go, we are going to launch another one um, very soon. It's going to be on a different topic. We're going to try to, you know, try to rotate. We got like seven or eight big topics um, and we pretty much want to rotate them, rotate them um, throughout the next couple of months, you know? So um, if no one don't have any questions, um, Y'all are free to go. Um, and I definitely appreciate y'all reaching out. Um, again, y'all have my number. I text everyone here. Just reach out to me if you have any other questions. And y'all need to top in with personal training because I, I don't know. Some of y'all probably ain't been to the range since y'all came through my class. You know, I ain't going to call y'all out, you know, but let's make that happen. Um, we are building a community here. Y'all like the first ones that are pretty much um, in this community. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna keep in contact with y'all. We're gonna keep, you know, trying to just build this um this community of responsible gun ownership. That's the goal. All right. So y'all go ahead and get, get back to y'all families. Have a good one. And for those that's already signed up for the class, I'll see y'all soon. Um, but other than that, y'all have a good one.